I want to talk to you today about two things. Normally, I talk to you about how the bank works uh, and uh, our, you know, our costing and our infrastructure um, costing uh, e estimates. But um, if you're new to the coalition, maybe you can go to the uh, to the webpage and uh, there's some videos there on how this bank works. Uh, but since our our theme this time is uh, the Congress punts again, and we would like to uh, uh, in, enact a national infrastructure bank that will really do the job, uh, I wanted to do two things today. I wanted to tell you about uh, the latest developments on trying to finance infrastructure through the budget. And then I would like to tell you uh, a little bit about uh, proposals in Congress for infrastructure bank proposals uh, to top up this spending and then how they differ from our uh, bill, HR 3339, uh, which will do the job and bring us a home run for infrastructure in our country. So uh, to start out with, this is a slide on developments of uh, funding, financing, or trying to finance infrastructure through the budget. Some of you may uh, have been following the news and knew that uh, President uh, Biden, when he first uh, introduced all of his packages, had an American jobs plan for infrastructure and then an American families plan, and then he still needs to uh, come up with a budget for the next fiscal year. Uh, but the um, American jobs plan has been sort of supplemented or replaced now by this Senate bipartisan plan, uh, which has uh, enough uh, Republican uh, co-sponsors on the plan to see, to see if they can get it uh, passed through a 60% uh, vote, uh, 60 vote margin in the Senate. Uh, this bill, uh, it calls for, it's a, it's a plan so far. It's not a full bill. Uh, the framework calls for uh, spending $580 billion in new money over the next five years. Uh, most of it is for transportation. There's a little tiny bit in there for water infrastructure and some for um, uh, broadband everywhere. Uh, the, uh, the problem has, the Senate whittled this uh, way down in size. Biden's plan used to be something like $2 trillion, and now we're just down to $580 billion over five years. Uh, the, the, one of the reasons for whittling it down is the Senate was never able over the last five years to decide how they were going to pay for infrastructure. Uh, so in this plan, they uh, propose several ways to pay for it. One is through uh, implementation of something called an infrastructure financing authority. Uh, this is an unusual way to pay for anything through the federal budget. Normally, the ways that you pay for things, uh, if you propose something and you haven't got enough ongoing tax money coming in to pay for it, then you have one of three options. You can either cut spending someplace else, or you could raise more taxes, or you can deficit spend. Those are the only three options for financing something through the budget. So having this financing authority is very unusual. Tax uh, experts who, who've weighed in on this call it fairy dust or wishful thinking or whatever. Uh, be that as it may, we'll, we'll leave that aside for a minute. Uh, and then the second proposal in there was better IRS uh, tax enforcement. Uh, so the idea was that they were going to budget $40 billion to throw at the IRS so that they could beef up their uh, enforcement. And hopefully they would be able to, to then collect $100 billion in revenues. Well, when uh, that idea got a little bit flushed out or clearer, then the Republicans objected to it because they don't really want to pay any new taxes to pay for infrastructure. Uh, and then at the same time, progressives were coming along and they wanted to spend more on passenger rail and, and high-speed rail. Uh, and uh, they've re recently woken up to the fact that rail is better for the, uh, the climate uh, and for, for, the, uh, for the world because it just uses less energy. And so uh, it's, it gives us less CO2. But in order to have a full-fledged high-speed rail system, uh, you really need a whole lot of more money for, than that. And that would raise this, which would mean that they would be back to the problem of how to finance. So this is a conundrum here. Uh, the most recent uh, occurrence was that Schumer forced this plan to the Senate to, uh, on a procedural vote to, set, to ask, could they bring it to the floor to debate it? And uh, a lot of the senators, including some of those who were in the bipartisan group, objected. 
Uh, they said, no, 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 we're not going to agree to something, a pig and a poke, when we haven't, we don't know what's in it. So uh, they want to see actually the bill. Uh, and they were busy writing all, all weekend long, trying to write it, going back and forth on how this pay for us and all these other kind of things. Uh, uh, by the time it came to the Wednesday vote, the Senate uh, voted down on a procedural basis to bring it to the floor. So the idea now is Schumer is still working on the bill and uh, will bring it forward again uh, for a vote in the Senate. So maybe the bipartisan plan will pass, we're not sure, but then there's still this problem with infrastructure financing authority, which I'm gonna come back to. Uh, the second thing that's going on is that the, you, that the government needs to pass a budget for next fiscal year. And contained in the budget are things like reauthor the standard reauthorizations for transportation. That's embodied in a bill that was uh, passed by the House, the Deposio bill passed by the House for transportation. And then also for water infrastructure, both the Senate and the House have passed uh, uh, bills on water infrastructure. They're still quite small around the 30 to $50 billion range, uh, but they need to all be paid for. Uh, add to that, uh, um, Representative Clyburn uh, has asked for, has a bill in for much more uh, broadband money than is contained in bipartisan plan. And, he need, and he's asking for, for money for that. And in addition to that, uh, Seth Moulton from Massachusetts has a high-speed rail bill in for $250 billion, still not enough, uh, but he's asking for money for that. So these are, these are on the sidelines also asking for money. Uh, what you need to know is that the federal budget is in chronic deficit right now. Uh, we're spending um, more on uh, tax credits for children, which is a good thing. Uh, those, those started going out in July, and that will really help with uh, poverty and uh, child, you know, child care uh, in, in, across the country. But that creates more deficit spending. And then, of course, we need to appropriate somehow for all the normal discretionary spending that should occur in fiscal year 2022. And then on, add to that that there is a, a debt limit extension, uh, an extension on the debt limit, which, which uh, means that you don't need to have abide by any uh, debt ceiling, but that limit ends on August 31st. And so if all these bills are not in anything that's going to have re re result in deficit spending, uh, then it'll be hitting up against this debt limit and the GOP uh, might try to block uh, that way. And then add to that finally, uh, that we still have sitting on the sideline, the American Families Plan, which before was 8.1 trillion, and now has taken on some parts of the Biden infrastructure plan that didn't make it into the bipartisan plan. So that's more money. So altogether, the budget is in huge disarray. It's going to be really interesting to see how they do a bipartisan bill with 60 votes in the Senate and how they also do a, any kind of funding for the government under reconciliation process, which could result in deficit spending. But our, uh, if it goes up, then our deficit will go up and our debt will go up. So that's the status of where we are on funding infrastructure through the budget. Now, um, there have been calls for uh, infrastructure, infrastructure banks to finance or top up what the budget can't cover. Currently in the 117th Congress, there are uh, one, two, three, four, five bills uh, for infrastructure banks or corporations or investment authorities uh, that have just popped up. Uh, the first one, of course, is our bill, uh, HR 3339, uh, which calls for a, um, a, a bank to, a public bank to lend up to $5 trillion over the next 10 years for infrastructure. And we have a full costing of this money, okay? It didn't come from nowhere, but we have really good, uh, um, you know, um, uh, resources for, for, and, uh, for confirming that, that we need at least this much money to fix our infrastructure problems. Then we have four other bills. This one uh, is a bill called the Infrastructure Financing Authority, the same name that was used in the bipartisan plan. Uh, it, uh, is a, it put out by Mark Warner and uh, Senator Mark Warner from Virginia and has also a House uh, bill version of it uh, as well. Uh, this bill uh, asks for um, $10 billion appropriation from the budget. So that would have to be added. And then it uh, promises in the bill itself to be able to lend up to $210 billion over 10 years. So you can see that that's way not enough compared to our need. Our need is 5 trillion. So uh, it's too small. 
And then in addition to that, it requires public-private partnerships. Uh, Dr. Stephen Hubbard is gonna tell you why uh, that those are blazingly bad, uh, that's a blazingly bad idea, but suffice it to say that um, the, you do not get low cost financing when you go with public private partnerships because they have to have a higher internal rate of return. And our bank, for example, lends really low rates at treasury bond rates, um, will keep the financing costs down. This one will not keep the, and this will not keep the financing costs down. And these, these uh, benefits or net internal rates of return will go to private companies. They will not stay in uh, public hands and public good. Uh, there was a second, uh, another bill that was just reintroduced uh, by uh, Rep, uh, Rosa DeLauro from Connecticut. It's been introduced for the last 18 years or so, hasn't quite made it. Uh, it, it asked for an appropriation of 25 billion over five years, uh, which could make, make it possible for that fund to finance up to $250 billion out of the fund and then requires that public-private partnerships or P3s come up with another $250 billion, have a matching fund. So potentially this, this bank could lend out $500 billion. Still way too small compared to the need and requires public-private partnerships and requires a budget appropriation. Another bill that just came out uh, re really recently uh, from Rep. Uh, Sean Patrick Maloney from New York is essentially, as I read the bill, uh, it's really the DeLauro bill without P3s. So it asks for a budget appropriation of 50 billion. It'll, it'll lend out maybe 500 billion on a ratio of one to 10. Doesn't require public-private partnerships, but that's the biggest uh, appropriation that we need to come up from the budget to get this bank started and it's still way too small. And then finally, uh, Rip Carbajal from California reintroduced his National Infrastructure Investment Corporation. Uh, that would, instead of asking for money from the federal budget, would go to pension funds and ask to borrow money from them up to uh, 5 billion uh, uh, per year for five years, which means it could lend out 25 billion. Uh, and then it must pay to the pension funds a rather large uh, interest rate, um, which will make this bank and these loans possibly not competitive with say municipal bonds, much higher than the uh, rate of lending that the National Infrastructure Bank will charge. So um, it's not feasible, I'm not, not clear that this is feasible of a feasible proposal, uh, although it doesn't require public-private partnerships. So altogether, we really need to keep interest rate costs down on these proposals. It, the bank needs to be big enough to cover everything. And we want to avoid public-private partnerships, keep uh, infrastructure, public infrastructure in public hands. So that's it for me. Okay, so my name is Dr. Stephen Hubbard. I did my doctoral thesis on uh, infrastructure banks and why the Federal Highway Department Infrastructure Bank uh, failed. And it was basically uh, not enough money and uh, not enough money to manage it is the, uh, the short uh, list on that. So I'm going to talk a little bit. Oops, I'm uh, uh, at the, uh, the payoff slide here. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about public-private partnerships and uh, why they work in some circumstances, but they're not a panacea and they're certainly not a lifeboat that uh, can be depended on. So the basic model is, is that I have something that I need to do, but I don't have the political or an economic capital or the expertise to do it. And I also, as I look at it, maybe my costs are gonna be really high. And so then what I do is I look at whatever it is that's going to be built or provided. So it could be a service, um, or because I have asset here, but uh, but it could be a service also like trash pickup or um, uh, a network or a ballpark or whatever, plus the benefit minus the profit that the um, uh, private partnership is going to take away is either going to be positive for me or negative. And so let's just imagine that these can all be expressed accurately in dollars. And so that's basically what you're doing. So the key for this is that it's, uh, it only works if it's easy for the government to exit. So if you take, a, say, a sewer system and you uh, privatize it and you're basically locked into that company for 30 years, they can do anything they want um, with uh, the rates or hide things in the background and you're basically on the hook. In other words, you, there's no marketplace involved here because uh, a lot of times you hear, oh, let's turn loose the marketplace. 
on this problem. Let's know, let's give a monopoly to this one company and we're gonna cross our fingers to see whether uh, it works or not. And something else that's not really well known, but it's very important is that there's no long-term knowledge. So if I have a concession at a, um, a sports arena or something like that, and people are flipping burgers and making food and it's not being well done, I can change that company out for something else. They're coming in and using the facilities. And if the people who flip burgers or make the, whatever the food is from one uh, company and they're exchanged with ones from another, I haven't lost any knowledge. But if I build a water system that's privatized and the uh, company uh, basically uses low cost labor and has a large flow through of employees because they're not paying them benefits and things like this, then if I try and take it over later because it's failing, suddenly I discover that the knowledge that I need is gone. It's not there in the institution. And just as an example, someone uh, makes something and buries it. Um, if I have a photograph, the cost is nothing, but if they didn't document it properly, it could cost me millions of dollars to get that basic knowledge. So there's an enormous hidden cost potentially. So, uh, and as Alfek has said that basically PPPs need 10 to 15% because you can go uh, overseas and easily find 10 to 15% profit from various ventures. And why should capital come to your particular Berg if they can get 15% offshore? Um, and the uh, issue here is most infrastructure barely breaks even. Um, I've got a little bit later on, but uh, here, yes, 61% of roads in the United States break even or lose money. And I'll get back to that in a second. Um, but basically, um, there are government programs such as TIFIA uh, for transportation that have essentially the same mechanism that are offered by the uh, proposed banks and PPPs. And they have $1.6 billion worth of funds sitting there, and they basically made no rural grants. And the reason is, is because they just don't work for, for small utilities that don't have that enormous overhead. And so back to this, uh, this is from a Brookings Institute uh, paper, 60%, 1% of the roads in the United States break even or lose money. And so what happens is the profitable roads um, subsidize the unprofitable ones. So if you then privatize those profitable roads, guess what? Now, you know, someone like me who has a stock portfolio, I'm enjoying that money. And someone who basically um, can barely aff you know, afford a car and now has their taxes go up to pay for the fact that the money is flowing into my pocket. So that's just completely unfair. And, and as a result, basically they only work for one or two percent of uh, infrastructure. So examples, um, so does that mean that they fail? No, there are lots and lots of examples and, and there are quite a few but the Transcontinental Railway, Railway and the Erie Canal, which was finished under budget and ahead of schedule and was a roaring success, are two uh, examples that are used over and over again in the United States. As I mentioned, concessions, trash removal, some of the cities around Phoenix, for example, um, both use vector control and trash removal from contractors. And if one isn't doing a good job, they can change them out and there's not a big loss because they're all using standards equipment and the knowledge is easily learned. Um, but what happens when you privatize water systems? Food and Water Watch has looked at this. On average, the costs go up 33% for water systems, sewer percent 60% or more. And in 2014, you can go find it on YouTube, and it's in my slides here. There was basically a, a, a joint committee on private-private partnerships, and they had a contractor who has 125 years of experience, and he said, oh, yeah, only 800 to, out of the 52,000 U.S. water systems were privatized. And these are ones that can raise their rates without passing special legislation, 1.5%. Other uh, uh, famous fiascos, the Indiana I-69 would had Vice President Pence basically uh, uh, ballyhooing how much money this was going to save. Um, they fell behind. There was fighting between the contractors. Cost ballooned by 50%, and the government had to take over, and it was two years behind schedule. Another famous fl flame out was uh, SR-125 down in San Diego, south of me. That basically, there was a 50% uh, shortfall in revenue. They had misjudged the market. Um, they went bankrupt. There were millions, $750 million worth of lawsuits, and uh, took $40 million to basically bail it out. And they had to cancel I-805. And if you know anything about San Diego and expansion, there's terrible traffic and can take you an hour and a half to get through some of the interchanges. So, uh, but that's the, just like the small fry. What happens when you wind up for the big little warm up for the big leagues? London Underground, 1998 renewal, PPP, three different ventures, 
all uh, went belly up. The cost to London was 175 to 500 million. I actually talked to one of the managers who was doing cleanup and he said the austerity that they practice while trying to make maximize their money while you know glorifying the small changes that they were making, he said it takes them seven took was taking them seven years to recover for every year of austerity that went on during this fiasco. Three Mile Island was also a PPP. Um, I won't go into the details there, but basically they were um, trying to save money on a tax break, and so they had the reactor up and running when it had, was it illegally uh, illegally running. It shouldn't have been to tr try and uh, save a few million dollars on tax breaks and it cost one to two billion dollars. Privatization of the Texas grid was starting in 1970 when it was done, supposedly because they disconnected it sort of from the rest of the nation, supposedly because Texas was going to do it right. The prices, prices over that time from 1970 to 2011 went up 60 percent faster than the rest of the country. Um, they've paid since 2004 28 billion dollars more for their power. In 2011, uh, there was a cold snap and, and uh, the government warned them, the FERC, that their system was at risk for a major disaster. What did they do with the 10 years of um, uh, warning before the 2021 cold snap this uh, February? Absolutely nothing. 4.5 million homes without, went out without power for weeks on end and it was responsible for somewhere between two to four 200 to 700 deaths, and uh, the total cost is $28 billion. California power crisis, 2001 to 2002. We're going to deregulate the power grid and let the power of the marketplace uh, take over. The power was going to go down by a factor of three. And instead, um, because the system could be gamed, the power went up by a factor of three. I was working at the Metropolitan Water District at the time, which before, uh, uh, supplies uh, th um, two thirds of the water to uh, 8 million people here in, or excuse me, 18 million people in here in Southern California by volume. It's the world's largest water company. Our costs went up $132 million for the same amount of power in one year. And it took out one third of our $500 million rate stabilization fund, which we'd spent 15 years building up. Then the cost of the country was 45 billion. It threw California into a recession and then threw the US into a recession. If you remember when Bush take go, took over, he said, oh, the, there's, the economy isn't nearly as good as we thought. What caused it? The California power deregulation. And finally, the, uh, the mother of all uh, fiascos, the Deepwater Horizon, which is privatization of uh, US uh, oil reserves. BP, as a warm up, was in charge of the uh, barge that was supposed to contain the spill at the Exxon for the Exxon Valdez. Of course, it was parked and wasn't available for two to three months if they tried to get into the water. So that was a huge fiasco. The cost of the Macondo well was $3 billion, but it was late. And the senior executives decided to save $100,000 um, and uh, cancel the Schlumberger team who was going to do what's known as a well log, where they look at the concrete with ultrasound to make sure that the well is sealed. The thing blew up, uh, spilled uh, billions of gallons of oil, and the cost is now uh, $61 billion and climbing. So, and, and so in summary here, there are five banks out there that are all based, um, and they're somewhere around 10 to $50 billion to start. Um, However, this yellow area here, this is the size of the um, deferred maintenance, excuse me, the backlog that we need to spend each year to uh, uh, basically um, cover the, uh, excuse me, to uh, fix our infrastructure. And these little squares represent, this is a $10 billion um, a year PPP bank. And this is basically one to 2% um, uh, uh, which is what uh, PPPs can cover. And the yellow square represents the total need. So as you can see, these things are just absolutely not going to come close to filling the need. Uh, the actual backlog is four to $7 trillion and um, the banks are just uh, completely inadequate. And uh, I think I'll stop there.